Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. I'm Chris Munts, and this is episode 104. Don't abandon the canon with Dr. Anika Prather. Like many topics in education, we have strains of the same philosophical divides in music education as we do in other areas of education. This week, my guest, Dr. Prather, is the perfect person to address and offer a bridge to one of those divides. She has a background in both music education as well as theater and literature. In this episode, we discuss educational philosophy related to the Western canon in both literature and in music. Trying to make sense of the various approaches that range all the way from a purely classical education to the decolonize the classroom movement on the other side of the spectrum. The discussion centers around the idea that both extremes, when taken as wholly sufficient philosophies, miss some very important aspects of history. Maybe a hybrid approach is needed. I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation as it ranges in and out of music education and into education more broadly. And of course, it's no secret that I have some problems with the way that we talk about literature and repertoire uh, through purely a cultural and racial lens. And I think this is a really good kind of checking of all the bases of how that conversation could go in a world that isn't so polarized. So stick around and listen all the way to the end because you're going to want to hear this conversation. There is nothing quite like bringing one of your choirs to New York City to perform in one of the great halls, but it matters who you travel with and it matters who creates that experience for you. They are not interchangeable, and I've discovered that Distinguished Concerts International in New York, DCINY, is far and above the rest, especially for those of us from parts of the country that don't turn out for the arts in the way that New York does. Your students, your singers deserve that. I've had personal experiences with a few different companies that have done this type of tour, and I can tell you that it matters who you choose. It matters who you entrust your students' dollars, their time, their energy, and their hopes for a trip like this, because it's a big deal. And for the students, oftentimes it's a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Check out DCINY and the offerings that they have there at DCINY.org. This show is produced on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy by Brannigan Lawrence, Vasquez Academy of Music, John Warner, Ulrika Ygrain Munoz Alarcón, Angie Schilling, Chandler Smith, David Gowalsik, James Mock, Jeff Wall, Kyle Peterson, Michael Heron, Nathan Hines, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakachik. You can support at Patreon as well and be a behind-the-scenes supporter of this show to make sure that I don't ever have to stop doing it. So head on over there and check it out. Okay, everybody, I'm here with Dr. Anika Prather, and we are going to have a, an exciting conversation, a great conversation, one I've been wa- uh, wanting to have for quite a while, about our ideas about education and where we find our literature, our repertoire, uh, and what do we look for in that repertoire, and so just some of our, our philosophies about uh, th- what is important for students in education. So I'm excited to bounce my ideas off of yours, so welcome, Dr. Prather. Thank you for having me. It's going to be fun. So first, why don't you tell us about you? Uh, My audience are mostly music educators, um, and I know you do have some background, but I won't spoil your story. So who are you and where do you come from? I am from, I was born and raised in D.C., Washington, D.C. I live now just outside of D.C. um, in Southern Maryland, really close to the, um, like the Potomac River. And uh, I um, have a BA in education from Howard University with a minor in theater. And I went back to get a master's in theater education from NYU and then went back to Howard to get a master's in music education. And I did that because I really had an interest in how music and drama can be used in the core classroom to bring specifically literature or English and history to life. And so, um, and so I somehow, after I got my master's in music education, my, my parents um, opened up a classical school and I was their music and drama teacher around that time, but ended up becoming very much involved with their great books class, which took me on a detour to, to get a master's in liberal arts, which eventually turned into a whole research project on the relevancy of the canon classic literature to the black community, but I still incorporate music and drama with that. That's awesome. And and I'm going to have you expand on a couple things that you just said there, because I want to make sure everybody listening understands exactly what you mean. So first thing I would like you to expand on a little bit is when you say incorporating music and drama into the core classroom, core curriculum, what are some examples that you could share about like what you believe either should be happening or what it is that you like to do in that in that way? 
Okay, so there's two things that I see about the arts. I even feel this way about visual arts too. Um, there's two things. Number one, the first part, good. Uh, the first purpose I feel for the arts is just appreciation. Appreciation for a good painting, a good piece, beautiful piece of music, a beautiful song, a piece of theater and literature um, being dramatized on the stage, just, just for the sake of appreciating it. Mm -hmm. And it's something about the arts that open us up. So um, as a tradition, when I've taught, I've always started off the class with close your eyes, let's listen to this piece by Mozart, by Beethoven. And just kind of, it just kind of, you know, disarms you and prepares you kind of like a meditative practice. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I love presenting a piece of art that we just discussed Socratically, like what, what do you think the artist was saying, which is also another form of learning. And then dramatization, um, dramatizing um, text, history, and things like that. And so I see it as a tool for teaching and illuminating whatever is going on in the classroom. And I see it as a way of um, relaxing and centering ourselves to prepare for learning. Mm -hmm. And so my way of using the arts in the classroom did both of those things. Um, and, and, and there actually is a part of my dissertation where um, I, in, in my dissertation, I interviewed students that I taught great books to. And one of the students, and he was like in his 20s when I did the, the project. Um, and he's reflecting, it's a reflective dissertation. So they're going back to when they were in high school taking my great books class. And he, he was like, um, my favorite part of your class is when you'd have, have us lay on the ground and listen to Beethoven or Mozart. And you would just have us imagine like I just, it wasn't connected to an objective or a classroom lesson or a scope and sequence, but just listen to this, close your eyes, relax, take deep breaths. And when you hear this music, what do you imagine? And a lot of times we would do a lot of creative drama from that exercise. So they'd come up and I'd have them share, well, what did you see? And sometimes we'd create a whole production based on what they imagined. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, so I just, it, it's always my go-to. Um, the arts are just an integral part of, of everything I do with education. Yeah, and so I would say, I would assume, based on the way you're describing it, that you would probably agree with this, that that not that it's meaningful and valuable for students, even if their focus is not, I am a musician or I am an artist. This is something that is for every type of student. Yes. Also, um, the arts help to tell history because... Mm -hmm. Whatever is going on in the art world is illustrating what's going on in history. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I will do a lesson um, and I will find whatever music or drama or whatever is either going on at that time or was written to express what was going on at that time. Mm -hmm. And we will study that. And so it becomes this really multifaceted lesson plan. Right, absolutely. That's wonderful. Now, one of the other things you said in your in your story of origin uh, is that you talk, you mentioned the term classical school. I want to make sure we define that because uh, I think that we might come back to that later. So, what is in your mind? What is a classical school? How would you define that? A classical school is a school that um, study the studies the works of the canon, but has an understanding that the works of the Western canon are rooted in ancient Greece and Rome, and that all of those authors are engaged in this great conversation. And if you bring uh, that has spanned ancient times to, to modern day, but what they have in common is they're referencing these old texts and rewriting them and retranslating them and, um, and um, appropriating them within their own lives. Okay. So what a classical school does is it, it, it teaches students how to and engage with that literature and then to participate in that great conversation themselves. So that's the first part. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of it is it's just an overall practice in teaching students how to think critically through analyzing literature, analyzing science, analyzing math, and engaging in this constant conversation to understand the, the information. Mm -hmm. Now, is the school that you currently operate it do you consider it a classical school or is it uh, like a hybrid of that mixed with other philosophies how do you how do you yeah, put that together i call it classically inspired okay uh, i'm very careful to say that because the actual classical school movement has a very especially those of us who who went through the accs training you follow Dorothy Sayers and there's this whole methodology which i respect and honor and even implement a great deal of it in my class 
But I, my my school married, well, I don't want to even say it marries. It includes classical education and another one that a lot of people struggle with, they would say it's too progressive, called the Sudbury model, where students are given a lot of freedom to pursue interests, passions. A lot of them pursue music, um, for example. Like my school attracts a lot of artists. I'm going to say that. I'm going to be honest about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of my students are either a visual or performing artist of some kind. They're dance. And I'm not a school of the arts. It's just that the freedom lends itself for students to be able to express themselves creatively. So it's a lot of artists, a lot of um, musicians, a lot of dancers, um, poets, just people, students who have a creative flair to them. Um, and so like I have three children of my own, two of the three are hardcore artists. And so um, music and visual. Mm -hmm. So, and so we have a, that. And so what happens is, part of the day, they're going through a classical curriculum, pretty traditional in its approach. And then the other part of the day, they are freely, you know, in, in art studio, in music studio, um, just freely pursuing their arts and their creativity. That's amazing. Other That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think, because I don't think we, we uh, I asked you directly, what is the name of the school and what is the age group that it serves? The Living Water School. Mm -hmm. And it goes from K through 12. Um, yep, K through 12. That's we used awesome. to have a pretty cool one before, but after the virus, we, we closed it down. Okay. Yeah. Right. Now, um, I'm going to back you up again to something you mentioned just so we can get some spotlight on it. You mentioned that the Sudbury model, sometimes people struggle with that because it's so progressive. In what way it do you, is it progressive? And when you use that term, what do you mean progressive? So the Sudbury model by itself, is a philosophy that if anyone's listening to me, I know eyebrows may raise, it work, It really works. Um, where students with support and guidance, and I'll say sort of this protection of adults in the space are completely 100% free. There are no classes. There is no, there are no grades, grading assignments. They're in this space and they're learning how to, and there's different rules and protocols and traditions that they follow, but they kind of live in their own little democracy in the school building. Mm -hmm. um, and what comes out of that though, is um, students who become, they're very empathetic. They're very clear on what their goals and missions and passions are. And what they do is once they decide, hey, I want to be an astronaut, then they will teach themselves everything they need to know to work towards that when they graduate out of high school. Mm -hmm. I want to be a musician. So they focus on music um, and they kind of create their own path, learning path to get to where they want to go. Um, I've met students who they want to get into a certain kind of college. So they find online classes that they take so they can build the transcript that allows them to go to the college of their choice. But the students have complete autonomy and authority over how they do their life. So um, there are a couple of reasons why I didn't go that route in the purest sense. One, my husband said no. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys work and, together. Uh, you work together. That's my dude. He's my best friend in the whole universe. And I felt like an educational philosophy was not worth a jacked up marriage. So oh, okay. we decided to compromise. And um, that's how we came up with the half and half. Um, classical, because he, he he values classical education, classical education and Sudbury. And but instead of trying to mix them and confuse them, like literally it's split in half. Part of the time is classical, part of the time is Sudbury. And it's created a nice nice little balance where students feel like they're getting the most important. Um, I, I, I'm finally very happy with it. Um, they get that freedom that they need to figure out who they are, what their purpose is, what the natural gifts that have been planted in their hearts may be and to explore that, those interests. Um, but then they also, especially because we're, we're dealing, and my husband, I, my husband, made, I'm gonna say this really quick. My husband, what made me kind of say, honey, let's compromise is my husband, he has a lot of wisdom. I love him dearly. He finally said something that got me to say, let's compromise. And it was African, my school is predominantly African-American. African-American people have, education was used as a weapon against them where they weren't allowed to have classes and they hungered for education, mm -hmm. for reading, writing and math and to learn. And he says, you know, if you try to bring that to a black community, they won't process it the way some others may. 
they will immediately distrust that are you trying to keep my child from having an education? And 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 he's absolutely right. Yeah. And it caused me to reflect on the fear in the black community about missing out on the kind of education they, their child needs to progress, to go to college or whatever. So when he said that, I at that point I put my my, my uh, guards down and I said, well, let's get together and figure out how we can, because I do believe there's some validity into this, in this freedom. And I believe it works, but married with his thoughts, we came up with this um, school that has connected to both types of philosophies. And I'll even say that classical frees the mind, Sudbury frees the body. And so Ooh, that's good. Mm -hmm. And because you're you're constantly engaging with this literature and you're in Socratic dialogue and you're able to you know ask questions, voice your opinions, and to just think. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen that develop in our students. Yeah. Yeah, that's I really like the the freeing the mind versus the freeing the body because mm -hmm. in my experience, uh, I never went to a classical school, but I've had some teachers and professors over the years that taught us with with that idea yeah. in mind. Um and and it's almost like with classical education, you're you're being given the tools and developing the tools to free your own mind because you're learning to master your own mind. And with with what it sounds like you're describing, Sudbury, it's um, you, you're giving the kids uh, guidance and and structure throughout the day, but then within within that structure, they're being given all kinds of choices to develop autonomy. And like yes. this is my education; it's not my teacher's education; it's mine. And what do I want to make of it? Yeah. Yeah. That's and they vote. Yeah. Like a lot of the, most of the decisions of the school day, the school year are done, not because I make them. I don't make decisions without the vote of the students and the parents, um, mm -hmm. even a field trip. Um, a student can even tell me a, a textbook that we purchased for them is not working for them and that what they need and we will find it. So it's a constant conversation and collaboration and partnership between us and the families to provide the best education for every child. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Now, how do you feel? This is not really one of the things that I was th planning to ask you, but now it's just popped into my head, which is that how do you feel about your rela the relationship of your private school entity with the public school? Because I'm a public school educator, and I'm trying to picture how I could make any of these things work in my system. And I'm like, I don't know that I could do that, any of these things. So how do you um, see your, you, you in that ecosystem? There's two things. Um, I want to share a word for those who are in the public school system. I was a public school teacher, and then I was in a and I taught in a traditional private school as well that didn't have this philosophy. There's two things. Number one, I see myself. I do see myself as a partner with the public school. I am not against public school education. It's very important. I try to always articulate that. Um, I and I'm not against traditional education. I just feel like no one philosophy or school fits every single child there you go so, yeah that <laughs> and yep. so and so what i what i see my what i try to do is have a, a good relationship a positive relationships with local public school educators so that they and they do that like i'll recommend the schools private and public will recommend you know uh, this is not working for you but hey i know a school you know mm -hmm. don't tell the parent here's her number you know here's a school you may want to try mm -hmm. And, um, and I'll get a call from a principal. Hey, I got this student and I love him. He's great, but this is just not working for him. And I don't want to lose him or her. And they'll come try my school. And there's that kind of a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't feel like I'm competing. I'm not here to criticize public school. I'm not here to try to get more students because I really want to stay small, actually. Uh, we have 35 students. Um, and we, we've had 50, but with the virus, we went down. So we're working our way back up, thank goodness. Um, and that's intentional because it, I don't think this philosophy works on a big scale. And so, right. so that partnership is important because you always, every principal, every teacher has a child that just is not working with the traditional approach or doing well in the public school. We also attract a lot of families who, whose kids are um, bullied a lot. So our, our students mm -hmm. are very tender hearted. They're very, some of them have come with suicide they were suicide survivors, like attempted suicide survivors or some type of low self-esteem or struggles with depression. And they found a lot of healing in our school. And, and that came through just word of mouth. And so in that sense, I see myself as a partner. I wanna be a solution. I wanna be um, a, just this entity that's located close by that any teacher or parent who's heard of us can 
see a child that's struggling and, and care enough about that child to say, hey, I know the school, she lets you pay what you can afford. Uh, and I think it will work for you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's one. Yeah. The other thing I like to say is um, there are these pockets of time in any school day that you can give a teeny bit of freedom or a, a teeny bit of non-traditionalism. Mm-hmm. It may be, and, and if you if you plan it out in your long range plans so that maybe the week of Christmas break is a, is a, you know, a couple of days because during that week before Christmas break, all that's happening is Christmas parties and the kids have zoned out and the teachers kind of start doing Christmas worksheets and making Christmas cards or, you know, preparing for the, there's different in, in, in the Christmas production rehearsals are going on. So the teachers hardly have anyone in the classroom. So they can't really teach anything anyway. So they have like five kids who are not in the play in the room. Like they're these little pockets. And I always tell people who are in those spaces, find your pockets because any amount of freedom will make a major impact in a child's life. Mm-hmm. Any amount of non-traditionalism, any amount of creativity, it doesn't have to be all year long, all week long, all day long. It could be a moment. Maybe it's right after recess, um, which is your read aloud time. Maybe you use that time to, to implement something, to read something, to have a Socratic dialogue about something. Or maybe you create a club that meets after school, or maybe you have students who sign up who want to do it with you once a week during their recess period. You're willing to give up your break to do it with them during their recess time. You know, so and and these and um, and I've heard stories of, of teachers who've done this and 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 just and then you know then they go right back to the curriculum they stay right on schedule but they found these little pockets which I call the freedom pockets where mm-hmm. your principal won't get mad at you that you're doing this little activity at this odd moment in the school day or school week um, and then it it will become very impactful to your classroom as well. Don't forget that Sight Reading Factory is ready for you and your students next school year when the school year starts. I am just over the moon with how our second semester finals with Sight Reading Factory just went, and I was so proud of the kids. They, of course, are all leveled according to their appropriate level. They get graded based on growth. They get graded based on independence and not what their ability to be perfect the first time. And I can tell you guys, it works. The reading level in our program is way over what it was a few years ago, and Sight Reading Factory is a tool that I could not have done it without. So get your memberships and enter Coralosophy at checkout for 10% off. You also need to use your Coralosophy checkout code at mymusicfolders.com, graphitepublishing.com, and ryanmain.com to get some discounts on some great choral gear, sheet music, singer's masks, all of the things that these great vendors provide. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. That sounds wonderful. And I, I agree completely. I think the question is not... Uh, do do kids need freedom in their education, or do they need structure? It's that they need both. Yes. And and ma- and master educators are the are the ones who figure out the balance for for each kid, because it's also not the same for each kid. Yes. You know, yes. I think that's great. I think that's great. Let Let's talk about a little bit now about um, literature and and music. Uh, because that's one of the things that I think is really interesting uh, to draw parallels between. With, uh, of course, you have a music background as well, and uh, and there is this idea, in of course the classical model of education, which is like you mentioned before, the uh, connecting to a certain body of literature and then taking ideas from within that body of literature and expanding them out into our life. In the same way that if we think about classical music, for example, that refers to a particular body of repertoire and yeah, yeah. Uh, of, of thinking about music. Um, and of course, in a lot of our schools, uh, even if they don't call themselves classical schools, there is still a quite a bit of tradition in the literature, the, I guess you could say canon of yeah. literature in both, uh, in both music and uh, in literature that is tied to this classical I guess, body of, uh, of knowledge. So right. how do you see that? Because of course, I know in education right now, uh, that's kind of a hot button topic. There is the, 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 of course, the decolonization movement within education, which is to, uh, of course, that, that w- they would be on one side of the spectrum, which is to get rid of as many things from that aspect of as possible, all the way over to, um, I guess, somebody who would fully be classical, and in which case they just want to do that, uh, and obviously you've got a hybrid thing going on. So how do you, how do you draw the line and how do you make your decisions about which aspects of classical repertoire and literature get played or, or read uh, versus other things? Well, that's a good 
question. Um, my first model is that um, the importance of the human story. And a lot of times we tend to elevate um, certain human stories as more relevant than others. Mm-hmm. Um, and I try to create a school. Well, let me say this. I, my, my main philosophy is classical education. So let me say that first. And, the, and, and to that end, I do want to say every educator chooses a philosophy that, that really connects to their heart. We don't know why. I don't feel like any philosophy is better than the other. I actually really love, I wanted to teach a class, maybe one day I will when I get the time, on educational philosophy, because I find all of the different educational philosophies very, very um, intriguing. Mm-hmm. And whoever created their philosophy had some type of experience, maybe it was with their child, they come up with this philosophy, whether you're Montessori or classical or Waldorf um, and so on. I chose classical because that's just how my life worked. My parents started a classical school when I finished graduate school and I got involved with it and I began to see just a lot of great things happen. So my, my heart is with classical education. I'm like, you know, and that's just where I am. So that being said, this is how I create who was who what curriculum and what literature and what experiences are welcomed into my school my program if classical education is the palette that i am connecting to authors no matter what color they are no matter where they're from who have some type of appreciation for that you can see it kind of um, sprinkled in their writings you can see it just kind of and if you read their autobiography or biography, you get a sense that this is the kind of education they had and they appreciate it. And somehow it comes out in whatever work they've accomplished. And so I invite that in and that gives an act. And because classical education has been such a shared heritage for so many different people from Gandhi to Martin Luther King, to Malcolm X, to Huey P. Newton, to the, 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 the Muslim community back in, you know, who preserved the works of Aristotle. I mean, so many different people have connected to classical education over the times, Mm -hmm. you know? Classical education is such an integral part of black history. It's it's part of a lot of the history of HBCUs. So it's very easy to diversify that, um, even though people haven't always talked about that. (laughs) Um, And so I just, and so I do that. Another thing I do is I may read one piece of literature. And if I know there's a black author, another person of color, who somehow has referenced this text from the canon, we'll go and read that one so we can show why would, you know, why would Lorraine Hansberry mention Prometheus in A Raisin in the Sun, you know, and we'll read Prometheus Bound, or, you know, that's just a, a common example I use a lot of times. Um, and so that's, that's how I decide, classical education actually is my guide for knowing who, had, who who comes into the conversation, and it hasn't it hasn't been as um, discriminatory as people would think. Yeah, no, of course you don't have to convince me uh, there because I, I, I agree. I think that there are, and I, I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna bring up this term again because I think this would be your person listening who would be uh, disagreeing with you would be somebody from like the decolonize the classroom mm-hmm. movement. Right. Yes. How, how, what are your thoughts about that approach? And what are, what are some of the problems that you see with it? Um, I'm going to throw one out, but then I want you to bounce your ideas off too. And one of my problems that I see with it is it, um, it, it it's basically a walking logical fallacy, which is that, uh, that it, one, you could call it the genetic lo- logical fallacy. And I don't mean genetic like DNA. I mean, genetic, meaning where the, the idea has its genesis, yes. does not validate or invalidate how it's used other places. Right. And, it, and it sounds like that's exactly what you're saying, which is that uh, there are tons of people from all, to all walks of life who have been influenced by this body of literature, and then they made it their own, and then they took yes. it and did other stuff with it. Yes. So what are your thoughts? Know. What are your thought, thoughts about decolonize? You know, it's, you know, you'll sometimes hear people say we need to read more, you know, Zora Neale Hurston or some of those, you know, because Zora Neale Hurston just told our story so beautifully. But one thing people don't realize, for example, is like many, most, if not all of the authors of the Harlem Renaissance um, read, read classics, they read the canon, and they, they, um, they kind of uh, tried to emulate the epic 
in how they told the black story. So to understand the style of writing of someone like Zora Neale, Zora Neale Hurston, um, you would have to have read the Odyssey. You would have to have read, you know, where she got the inspiration to write these stories that tell these epic adventures of, you know, Janie, Janie, or you know, and um, their eyes were watching God. You know, this this journey that takes you away and then brings you back home. You know, mm-hmm. people don't understand that she's she's inspired by that. Um, I, I'm gonna make it broader than just talking about the decolonize the curriculum people because I, I look at it and I say there's there's an issue there and there's an issue with those who are against uh, diversifying. They, they want to take, they want to cancel books that they feel are making white people feel too guilty. And yeah, I just, I'm right. going to say, right. I'm going to say that everyone needs to stop trying to cancel people's books. Yes. You know, yeah. I'm going to say, let's <laughs> yeah. be open. I think, I think one reason people cancel books is because they haven't read the books. They have believed what some politician said, what some, uh, activists have has said, and 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 they're regurgitating cliches that these people have said that sound really, you know, you know, beautiful and catchy, but they haven't read Prometheus Bound. They haven't read the Odyssey. They haven't read a Shakespeare play, and valued it and understood that it really is telling the story of every person. And so I I want to, or they haven't read um, those people who want to get rid of some text like I read recently not that long ago somebody was trying to they may have succeeded in one county in a state where get it was getting rid of the uh, the story of ruby ruby bridges you know and so mm. um we need to stop fearing literature um when we fear literature we act and and, and try to cancel it we we limit ourselves we um we kill a whole narrative that could that we could all benefit from and what I would like to say is make another set of, um, that's why I like classical education, but uh, so I can only speak from classical education. I love classical education because it has given me sort of this kind of standard that I can use that helps me choose literature. Now, someone's going to read that and say, oh, but that's, you know, she's using classical education, but that's a bunch of white people. So she's going by their standard. And then I would come back and say to them, well, Martin Luther King read them. Most of the Black Panther read them. And many of the books in the canon started the, the beginnings of the canon, you know, because it's it follows the timeline. Um, didn't know anything about white and black and racism and Jim Crow, you know, and, and not in the sense that, you know, that we know about it. And so they were just trying to tell a human story. Mm-hmm. Um, and so and so I I boldly and without apology have said, you know, classical education is the philosophy I've chosen and it gives me kind of this um, foundation to know. And so what do I do? I go, I say, well, Du Bois read these. Oh, Frederick Douglass read these. Oh, my goodness. Zora Neale Hurston and Toni Morrison and, you know, all of these people and Barack Obama. Like, I mean, right. all of these people read this stuff and have done amazing things. Abraham Lincoln and um, yeah. and so on. Uh-huh. So. And that, that is how I know who to pick. Well, of course, that does take me away from reading like the young adult literature. I don't read that as much. And right. someone may fault me for that. And that's Nobody can read everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, I, I wouldn't lose sleep over that. <laughs> you, no, <Right>. nobody, <laughs> nobody can read everything. And so here's, here's my, uh, you're nicer than I am. Because when I hear, uh, because when I hear stuff like, classical literature, and I would put this into the category of a lot of early Renaissance music too, um, but with speci- specific, specifically with classical literature, when someone says to me that that's a bunch of white people's ideas, um, I just tell them that they're historically illiterate because, because the concept of being a white person didn't even exist then. Like that, that was a, that's a 1500s and 1600s idea Yes. Um, that was invented to justify slavery. So I'm not yes. taking on that idea. No, yes. Thank you very much. Right. Um, right. So, you know, and not to mention, I, I, in fact, after the show, I'm going to send you a link because I had a, a conversation back before you and I met on Twitter on this show that you would probably really appreciate uh, with Professor Kiros from Berkeley School of Music. He's their philosophy professor there. He's an Ethiopian professor. Wow. Um, and he uh, went off on this topic in a beautifully elo- eloquent way to point out that even the ancient Greek philosophers and authors 
were borrowing ideas that they had learned from Ethiopian philosophers. Yes, yes. and they were, and they, they didn't mind sharing that. Right. Especially, well, because the concept of race didn't exist. Right. There's, right. I mean, you can, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, if you read the ancient, especially ancient Greece and Rome, Roman authors, they will tell you, I got this from the Egyptians, I got this from the uh -huh. Ethiopians. They will acknowledge that they're building on from from that shared knowledge that mm -hmm. and, and this is another thing um that people don't understand and this is it makes me sad that people think they are decolonizing it by taking classics because what they're actually doing is they're taking a part of black history okay. when they remove classics when they remove the canon even from students of color especially black students you are depriving them of something that connects them to their black and african ancestors mm -hmm. and that's a problem you're not helping them. Yes. You're depriving them of their history. And I get really passionate about that. So let me calm down. No. Uh, because, and that goes back to this, this, this myth that you're helping, but you're not. Um, one of the things that people don't understand, I was sharing this with someone, I can't remember who, who it was recently, but um, one reason why classics, especially the texts of ancient Greece and Rome were so important to the enslaved people it was their only access to Africa because these ancient authors talked so openly about the Ethiopian empires and the Egyptian empires, um, or they talked openly about Kush, which I think is also Ethiopia. I always get that mixed up, but they talked about it. And so, you know, Phyllis Wheatley references this. She references, you know, finding, uh, feeling some type of, um, grounding in reading these ancient texts because she was able to get some type of connection to her homeland on some level. And, and honestly, that connection played a huge part in saving them mentally because, you know, they're taken from their homeland, from their moms, their dads, their culture, anything connected to that space. They come to America or Europe or what have you. They end up in the master's house. They get their hands on an ancient text, or they overhear the reading of these ancient texts and they hear about their homeland. And they're able to find more out more about themselves that, I'm, that I am human because this text is saying that we were kings and queens and warriors and that we fought alongside them in the, in the Odyssey. You know, like, so they're, they're able to, and so a lot of the pride, and that's why Du Bois talks so much about You've got to read this literature. I found an essay by Mary McLeod Bethune saying, my people need the education of Phyllis Wheatley. And what kind of education did Phyllis Wheatley have? Classical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but that's that was used uh, to help us heal, help us find a language where we could tell our story in a way that people could understand. So it's a, it's a very important part of Black history that I will say uh, I don't know if those who are involved with decolonizing realize that it's actually hurting um, Black people's understanding of their history by doing that. I am so glad you said that because that is actually almost verbatim what my frustration is with that kind of thinking. Um, but of course, we live in the in 2022 with our concept of race that we currently abide with, which is not the one that existed when the classical authors were writing. Um, and so when I say it, it doesn't mean as much. Yeah. And, and that is, that is the reality. So, uh, for example, one of my, fr my biggest motivators for this topic is that I have a lot of black and brown students who are being raised to, to inadvertently in a world that is teaching them that all of the good ideas came from white people. Yeah. And, 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 and if we remove, kind of like you said, if we remove the classics from the education in order to help those kids, what we're, what we're removing is their connection to those masterful ideas. Yes, yes, yes. The same ideas were that Doug, Frederick Douglass, like, you know, they'll talk about, you know, what to the slave is the 4th of July, but they don't understand that the reason why that man was able to write such a masterful rhetorical piece was because he studied the writings and speeches of Cicero. Yes. And in classical education, you're yes. also studying rhetoric, you're studying logic, you're studying, uh, you know, how to, how to get my ideas to stick yes. in your brain. 
yes. like glue. <laughs> yes. And to be logical, you know, yeah. and, and Martin Luther King in his autobiography says the same thing. He was part of the debate team. He talks about how reading these works of the canon helped shape his philosophy for the civil rights movement. Like we need to know that as a people. Mm -hmm. There's so much as, and, 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 and also, this is the other thing, um, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King and others, one thing they all had in common was they desired to be a participant in our democracy. They desired that, you know, so some people think that these texts can separate us, they divide us, they teach us we're inferior, and they kind of create this superiority, this white supremacist mentality, but if taught properly and truthfully, they would do the opposite. They would actually bring us together because we can talk about how all of our ancestors have found themselves at these texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what is it about the texts? And this is why I, I like the connection between this and the musical idea too, music, classical music. What is it about the texts? What is it about the music that brings people from all cultures across the planet right to its door? Yes. You know, I've, I've frequently made the argument that, you know, if I were, this is rhetorical, again, uh, rhetorical and uh, a thought experiment, but if I were to pluck a young boy out of a, a tribal culture, say in Brazil, and this kid has been in the jungle his whole life, and he has never, ever heard music from outside of his tribal culture, and let's say I were to just give him a free ticket to a symphony in in a city somewhere, and he, he gets to go, and he gets to sit down and hear the symphony uh, play Mozart for the very first time. He's never been exposed to it ever in his life. He might hate it, absolutely. Yeah. But he, he, but he could act. Uh, he could be completely moved and changed in that moment because different people react different ways to music. And so then I would say, all right. So if, if has that kid just been colonized, or, <laughs> or has that kid just had an experience that moved him? And it's art. And who cares right, where it right. came from? And I think also another thing that people don't realize is they have um, <laughs> to your thoughts are making me think of this, um, a very compartmentalized perspective on human history. Mm -hmm. And um, what they don't understand is that every people group has had an opportunity to be a world ruler. Yes. You know, it, it, you know we can start with it. Um, I think we can agree that I think I believe ancient African civilizations were the first world rulers and you have Middle Eastern, then I think Greece, then Rome, and now we have, you know, the West or, or what have you, as you could say, kind of trying to make sure that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And okay, so if you, if you understand that timeline, then you understand that each people group was building on the one that came before. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so when white people try to, now this is where we go wrong though. Sometimes when we teach classics and white people say all this wisdom, all this goodness, all this beauty and virtue came from just ancient Greece and Rome, as if ancient Rome has always been the only world ruler. That is the, that is the fallacy. Yes. That and, is the we, and it's where the racism comes in yes. when we, try, when we try to make them, make them a yes. representative of white people because they weren't yes. white. They weren't white. <laughs> Exactly. They were, they were right. Greek. They were, they were Greek and Roman. And 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 the, the other and so the other piece to that is the the they the ancient Greeks and Romans knew that they their ideas were based on what they learned from the places they conquered. Mm -hmm. Or that came before them. Mm -hmm. And they'll talk about that. And so we need to be teaching if we taught it's not that classics need to be canceled. It's not that the decolonizing would it, it should 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 affect how we teach, not what we teach. Mm, okay. Not how we teach. We're teaching in a comma. We, when we teach that all wisdom and goodness came from ancient Greece and Rome, that's a colonized way of teaching. But when we teach, yes, these ancient Greeks and Romans wrote this beautiful literature. But it was also, if you read the text, you'll see they were basing their writing on these ancient African civilizations, these, these um, Middle Eastern civilizations, and they just built on that. And if mm -hmm. all of your teaching reflects how from numbers to stories to history is a conglomeration of all of the world rulers that we had coming up 
to this time period. Mm -hmm. So that's a decolonized way of teaching. And that when you teach these texts, if there's any mentioning, like, like, you know, um, I was talking about this with a Howard student and um, he didn't realize Cyrus the Great was from the Middle East, but it's very clear where the man was from in the text. You can read where he's, you know, you can pull up the map and look up, you know, and see that he was not ancient Greek or Roman. He wasn't from the West, mm -hmm. you know, and so um, and it's so important that uh, we understand that. And, and then the other part of decolonizing is understanding that there ain't, you know, ancient Egypt ruled the world before Alexander the Great. Like we, it's important that they understand that because mm -hmm. the way e ancient Egypt is taught now is as if it, there was, you know, it starts with Alexander the Great. And so they think that they look not black or they're not black or they're not African. And it, but there was this time where the ancient Egyptians were as chocolate as me. And they were considered the African people and the Egyptian empire spanned north, south, east and west. Same thing with Ethiopia. But then, of course, Alexander the Great comes in and that's a true story. And I'm not taking anything away from Alexander the Great. The man was phenomenal. I mean, I'm like, he was like otherworldly and I'm not taking that away from him. But when we teach history in this very inclusive way that everyone's story is powerful and important, no one's story is better than the other, but it just paints this beautiful tapestry of humanity that's decolonization yeah no i agree i agree i think that there, there's a, a really important distinction you're making there with with the how do we teach it versus what do we teach uh the what do we teach uh i guess model that we sh that i would advocate for is that we teach as much of much literature repertoire as we possibly can as as that we as teachers feel like we can masterfully teach Yes. And this goes back to earlier before where I said nobody can read everything. Right. Uh, I, as a musician, I can't learn every composer's stuff. Right. right. right? And, and I, I'm not going to lose sleep over that. But what I, what I am going to do is everything that I feel like I can master, I'm going to work as hard as I can to master as much stuff as I can from as many cultures yeah. and places and times as possible so that I can instill in my students a curiosity to go learn about more music. Yes. Um, and in literature, I would I, I would take the same approach is yeah. like, I'm, I can't yeah. teach him every book. I can't teach him every book and I can't teach him. A, a, I can't even teach him a book from every language and culture, <laughs> you know, but I could, but I can teach it in such a way that makes them curious to go find mm -hmm. out more after they leave my class. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. It. Yeah, that's important. Now, you know, because one of the, and I kind of, I know I hinted at this earlier, but I think a lot of what you were talking about of just understanding the the vastness of the history of all of this that people just don't know. And I, I, I would agree in saying that that's the part that got colonized, which is by, uh, which is by like teaching it as if it started in ancient Greece. Oh, and oh, by the way, those people were white. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, because that's, that's the problem right there. It's we're taking this four or 500 year old concept of, of race and then, and then uh, projecting it onto 2000, 3000 years ago when that concept just was not part of their head right. and it just doesn't work. And that's where the decolonization in the classroom movement goes wrong in my mind is they're apply, yeah. applying, they're applying today's race idea to 3000 years ago. Yes. Yes. And Du Bois, um, Frank Snowden, a classicist out of Howard University, mentions that in his book, Blacks and Antiquity. And Du Bois, I love um, some of his writings on what you just said and um, his, his um, essay of the training of Black men. He, at the end, he talks about this veil. What you're describing is the veil. Like we see everything through the veil of racism. Mm -hmm. We can't read anything. We can't appreciate anything because we're looking at everything through the veil of racism. Mm -hmm. And Du Bois talks about living above the veil, living above the veil. And what does that mean? Recognizing everything you just said, you know, and, and, and being able to appreciate that time period without that tainting. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say the, the modern day form of that veil is the person listening right yeah. now who says, well, that's his opinion because as a white guy, that's his opinion. Right. Or that's her opinion as a black woman. Well, yes. that's the veil right there. <laughs> there it is. It's almost an eight, isn't it? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Well, and we're so uh, we're so trained uh, yeah. that that is the first thing we notice. 
And it's one of those things where it's like this argument, and we don't have to go down this whole rabbit hole. We, we're, we're, we've been going at it for a while, but uh, of, of color blindness and how that's yeah, racist and all. Yeah. Well, it's like, okay, but it depends on what you mean by colorblind. Right. It's like a, 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 being colorblind could also mean that that's not the thing that I decide is the most important thing about you. Um, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean I don't yeah. acknowledge, it, it doesn't acknowledge oh, racism or, or whatever else. It's weird. It's weird what we've done. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So let's kind of kind of go in on on our way out and kind of wrap this up because my goodness, I could keep doing this uh, all evening. Uh, this is really fun to nerd out on this stuff with you. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so as you and for, well, actually, and, and this is going to be a really quick answer, I think, but because I, I forgot to ask you this at the beginning, and I apologize. But when you uh, were doing your music stuff, what was your music like? What was your what got you in the door as a musician? Um, I sang jazz. You sang so, jazz. Uh, yeah. Do you still at all? Um, no. <laughs> I uh, so I, I I've recorded, and you can if you go to my website, you can see how to listen to my drprado.com. I, I got this idea from a professor who is a professor, but he also does music, so he puts it on his website. So I do it too. But um, I have two projects out that I did back in my twenties. I have a band and everything, and I just sing. It's, con it's it's a mix of old jazz and contemporary jazz. And then um, I my master's at first was going to be jazz studies. And then as I really began to get into K-12 education and my love for bringing the arts into the classroom, I switched over to music education, but uh -huh. still have a love for jazz. Um, and my, my um, when I present, because I do travel and speak a lot, is um, I most like most times will sing um, Negro spirituals. That's my love. And my my um, graduating project, my master's project was uh, a, a, a curriculum I call I created called the story of African American music, and it talks about how black music came from Africa to here. So I take it from the music of Africa all the way, you know, through um, the Negro spirituals to um, Thing, blues, jazz, R and B, hip hop—you know—it goes all the way up. And how you can still see traces of there's certain elements of black music that you can see all the way up even until now, mm -hmm. whether it be call and response or the blue note, which is why our music tends to have, uh, even no matter, even if it has an upbeat feel to it, there's like a darkness to it. Mm -hmm. And that blue note was created in the in the slave fields. It was our way of moaning our hurt, and so you kind of hear that moaning, that darkness in our music. Um, and so that was my, and my main instrument. I do play the piano, but I do it secretly. Don't ask me to play for you. <laughs> me too. I secretly play the piano. Yeah. Yeah, that's main, awesome. My that's main awesome. is my, yeah. So, you know, and, and this will be pro probably my last question, and then we'll wrap this up, is that tying these these two loves of yours, your, the, your love of music and your love of literature and, uh, and, reading authors and think the like discovering the thinker i guess even better way to say it would be discovering the thought beneath the thinker uh right. like what is going on in people's minds uh as as an educator now uh you you're thinking about this this idea of of the canon and we have a canon what are your thoughts about how the canon evolves as we go forward into the future and a more um hopefully a more egalitarian accepting uh, future that is less um, interested in where the idea came from and more about yeah. what the idea is. How, how yeah. do you how do you envision that going forward? I'm hoping that we, you know, we're starting to have those of us who value the canon. We're starting to have these conversations like you and I are having now more. Um, even some of the most conservative people who you wouldn't think would be interested in this conversation are interested in this conversation. And my hope is that it grows, steadily grows, till it cancels out these myths and false narratives that we have about the canon. And that eventually all of us can be able to, be able to articulate its relevancy to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I worry that it's gonna happen fast, quick, that we're gonna all of a sudden be able to rise up and no one's gonna listen to those who wanna decolonize the curriculum anymore. I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna happen like that because their voice is very strong as well mm -hmm. um and rightfully so because you know the, the study of you know the, the canon those who read the canon <laughs> justified slavery you know so there there's a piece of that um but my hope is that we I'm gonna, can i interject can i yes. interject real quick 
I think the people that did that, though, they misused and misrepresented yes. the canon. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yes. Yes. It wasn't the canon. It's, I have this um, cartoon in my head that I'll say. Um, I have a, it's a picture of a classic text, a cartoon of a classic text. Uh-huh. And another picture of a group of people like being angry. And the book is saying, you know, what did I do? I'm just over here being a book. Like, you know, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's great. I love that. I wish I could get somebody to draw it, you know, and I agree with you on that. But I'm hoping that we continue to have these conversations till yeah. it just continues. Um, and also I have another a thought too that I I have stopped arguing with those who don't agree with me. I don't I don't engage in that discussion anymore. Um, I had to do it all the way to get out of my PhD and I'm tired. I want to have fun. So I I just focus on having this conversation with those who want to hear it. Yeah. And then we just continue to strengthen our belief in this together and continue to share it until it just spreads steadily. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting uh, that you say that because uh, I'm kind of there too. Now yes. I'm only, I'm not all the way there because I do this show, which means I continue to <laughs> engage in people. But the, the, you know, for example, we've been picking on the decolonize for a while and, th and that's a big deal in music education. That's like a big popular movement. Yeah. So there will be people who hear this, who get really mad. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and I uh, what 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 is also interesting? You no, go ahead, go ahead. I have because this is a music thing, and this is just yeah. something to put in the toolbox. You have to understand. I was watching this video of Flavor Flav. Have you seen this video of Flavor Flav? I've Flavor seen Flav, some things. Well, he's he's a classically trained musician. I did not know that. Most successful black musicians and artists, even Lizzo, is classically trained. Didn't know that either. So, uh, like, um, Duke Ellington was classically trained. I knew that. I didn't yes. know that. Jamie Foxx is classically trained. So, this is again with music. It's the same thing with the literature. When you take away classical music from Black people, you're taking away the kind of music that helped train the musicians they love to hear. Mm hmm. Now, if we connect classics with hip hop, Tupac loved the canon. That was one of his favorite classes. And do you not think that it inspired his, his music, his poetry? Like instead of trying to take, you're taking away the, the, the very thing that helped create some of their favorite artists. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be best instead to teach them about how classical music has inspired black music right how does that how is this music yours that that's i would love it if we would frame it that way because to me to me every frame that that says that that music is mine as a guy with low melanin count in my skin like that's what racism is it's not my music yeah I, I don't own that music that's frustrating to me, especially when I have students, again, who have more melanin than I do, who yeah. love that music. And so what, what, am I, what am I supposed to tell them? That's not yours? Right. <laughs> you can't have and that? That's the point. That's the point. It's our, like Nina Simone was classically trained. Yeah. All of the great jazz musicians of the Harlem Renaissance were classically trained musicians. Uh-huh. Like, what are we doing? Like, what are we saying? I mean, you're, you know, and then you're going to. And so, it, okay, you decolonize, you, you take this music away and you're replacing it with what? Something that has nothing to do with the history of their people? And, and but yet that's helping them? Mm -hmm. Classical music, classical education, I always, and, and I have a video, if you go to my YouTube channel, where I talk, actually I talk about this and I connect it to classical education and I define what is classic. Like, well, there's classical music, there's, and it, it basically anything from the West is classical. And that's what they're saying. But what they don't understand is that my people and a lot of other people's people took the West, took classics. I mean, um, Tony Easy Cole said it. Like we have, you know, we sadly it is. I mean, we didn't have any other language, but we became a child of the West too. And it's a part of our. It's in like the early pages of his book, uh, Between the World and Me. You know, we. It is a part of Black history that you cannot remove or you cancel out most of black history if you do is us taking the west and creating our own language and culture mm -hmm. from it so instead of 
removing it, we need to be teaching our students how their ancestors used classical anything to navigate this foreign land that they're in. Mm -hmm. What And what could be more empowering than teaching students that they their ancestors took a tool and and created something better and new and and life enriching out of that yeah, yeah. because that's all, that newsflash that's all the only option any of us have yeah like none of us are born into an empty planet yes. like we, we are all born into a planet with tools already existing and we have to take access to those yes. tools and then make them something yes, yes. it's wonderful Absolutely. Yep. I, I, I did, Anika, did we just become best friends in this last, <laughs> in this, in this last hour? I think so. so I feel, yeah, I feel like there, this is like, I mean, we're on the same wavelength with a lot of this stuff, which is really, yeah. really good. But I also think it's good to bounce our ideas off of how we explain it to, to people because uh, when you got kind of heated a minute ago, 20 minutes ago or so about, you know, of like the robbing of, uh, of robbing. black students of this stuff, I, I, I was right there with you. Yeah. Uh, because I feel that same passion for my students that, uh, you know, and that to me, it doesn't matter that our melanin, melanin is not the same. Yes. Uh, like it, they're my students and I, they're human to me, yes. which means that I know their name. I know their parents' name. I know where they came from. And I know that they deserve this, this repertoire and this literature. Yeah. Um, and, but uh, uh, so, but I'll throw a bone on the way out. If, if, okay. if the idea of the decolonization idea is resonates with you and someone listening if what you're talking about is really the diversification of voices, then yes, I'm, yes. I'm right there with you. Yes, yes. But you can't diversify by excluding things. <laughs> That's it. That's it. We shouldn't be canceling anything. We should be learning the history of it uh -huh. and who connected with and how it. And how it's all connected. That's yep, wonderful. Exactly. That's wonderful. Exactly. Uh, yeah. All right. So let, let's wrap this up. And anything on the way out that I did not let you say that you feel like you just need to get out there, this is your chance. My music teachers out there, I want you to look up a video of Lizzo playing the flute at the latest music awards. And she cool. played a classical piece. I don't, I'm not a fan of Lizzo. I think her music is a little bit, you know, I'm a church girl. So, you know, I'm, I'm gospel, <laughs> I'm Christian, but she's, she's hot right now. And yeah. I, I think the reason why is because she is a, she is a classically trained musician. Oh yeah. And you can tell in her melodies and in her, in her yes. ryth rhythms that she is creating something unique. Yes. She's a yep. musician. She's not just somebody taping tracks together. Yep. She's composing Agreed. Beautiful original music. Yep. Minus the words kind of make me say, "Okay, oh, Jesus, I gotta go pray." <laughs> but, <laughs> but the mu the musicianship, the, you know, the the yep. uh, com composition. Yep. Is music, and she Agreed. is classically trained. You know, so if you want to have an argument, just the next time somebody says anything to you, just show the video of Lizzo playing the flute at the latest of music awards, playing some, some, it's, it's a, it's a classical piece. I can't remember. It's not, it's escaping me right now, but yeah. That's awesome. I will definitely, definitely send people that way. Thank yep. you so much, Dr. Prather. This was a blast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of an episode. I always appreciate the faithful who get all the way to the end. Of course, if you enjoyed that conversation, or if you didn't, start a conversation about it. That is the point of this show, and I want to expand the conversation that I saw as shrinking three years ago when this show started. So make comments, share, leave ratings on podcast apps, and of course, you can support the show on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy for as little as $3 a month. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. This was a fun one, and we will see you next time.